How does a young American soldier serve eight years in the military as a staff sergeant in Iraq and end up being a conscientious objector and a prisoner of conscience? Today on Roundtable Perspective, Camilo Mejia, an Iraq war veteran against the war, joins me in an examining ideas, explanations, reasons for the war in Iraq and U.S. foreign policy and the consequences it has for public opinion. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Camilo Mejia. We're going to discuss reasons for U.S. foreign policy from the war in Iraq to uh, current interventions in Nicaragua. It sounds like a lot, but uh, Camilo, I'm happy to have you here. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Pleasure um, to be here. I kind of want to break our conversation into a couple parts, and the first part would be your um, experience of being a staff sergeant in the U.S. Army uh, for nine years and then having a tour of duty where you led other troops in, in uh, activity in Iraq and then your um, return home and that whole story. And you ended up with a book, uh, The Road from R. Ramadi, The Private Rebellion of Staff Sergeant Camilo Mejia. That was published some years ago. But um, we often see vets or soldiers and there's almost a knee-jerk response, thank you for your service. and. Um, I'd like you to explain before we get to the to the linchpin. What what drew you to the military? Why did you join the military? And you spent nine years there before there was this uh, reflection, I guess, or maybe that's wrong. You tell the story. Definitely. Um, well, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure uh, to be on the program. Uh, so let's start a little bit with uh, uh, my my background. Let's mm -hmm. go into my background a little bit because I think it helps explain. Uh, the, the, the path that many people uh, who come from similar background would follow to join the military. Well, you graduated from the University of Miami with a degree in psychology, and that was before you joined the military, or was that part of the reason? No, it was, it, it, it was a process to, okay. to graduate from college, so uh, it's kind of complicated, but we'll get into that. Okay. Um, I was born in Nicaragua in 1975, uh, which was a time of dictatorship, a dictatorship uh, that had ruled the country for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, the Somoza um, families uh, had ruled the country with the support of the United States, and that there had been a, a resistance movement that both my mother and father were a part of. And because of that, we eventually had to leave the country to come into the United States back in 75. And we spent some time here. My mother didn't like it. Uh, my father had um, done his own thing. They, um, the relationship between them didn't work out. Uh, from here, we went to Costa Rica, which is where my mother is, was born. And she's, mm -hmm. um, I'm actually half Nicaraguan, half Costa Rican. And while she was there, that once again, she became involved with the Sandinista movement. When the uh, Sandinista movement overthrew the dictatorship of Somoza, we moved back to Nicaragua and we spent about 10 years there. That would have been from 1979 to 1989. To 1980, 1990. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we left the, um, the country following the, 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 the electoral loss mm -hmm. in 1990, 1991. By the end of 1991, we were going back to Costa Rica uh, for about two years. And then from there, we moved to the U.S back in 94, still in high school, still a teenager, no sense of belonging anywhere because of all this moving yes, around. Yes. Uh, so as soon as I finished high school, well, th there were a couple of semesters in college, but no sense of belonging, lots of turmoil going on socially, culturally, in terms of friendships, and yeah. uh, not really having a sense of belonging anywhere because I had been moved around for so long and I was still in my formative Part of the years. turmoil sounds like many high school students or young adult lives anyway at that, at that point. So. Socioeconomic, right. cultural, travel. So how uh, does this get to uh, enlisting in the U.S. Army? I'm not, I mean, where does that, what's that step? Well, it's, it's very similar to the story of any um, kid who joins the military born and raised in the United States who's looking for a sense of belonging, looking some, for some financial stability, uh, a college fund to help with their education, etc. 
and I found myself in a situation very similar to that, mm -hmm. in which I no longer was living in a, in a privileged uh, condition, uh, which I was in Nicaragua and Costa Rica, but for the first time had to work for a living, wonder how I would pay for my college education mm -hmm. or get health care and things like that. And the military offered all of that uh, sense of camaraderie, sense of family, stability, travel, adventure, and then of course you can get educated you know, for serving in the military. So it seemed like, a, like the best option for me to achieve my independence mm -hmm. and be able to ensure myself um, a way into college and healthcare and all these other things. Um, basically what we refer to as a poverty draft that basically is behind the, the reasons why many people join the military. Is the, and the addition is it's a respected option. It's a respected And it's a respected choice, option right? as it goes. Yes. The, the rationale is that you'll be fighting for freedom and democracy and that you'll be fighting dictatorship and at the same time you'll, uh, you know, So this is, uh, this is the 90s. Uh, this is the 90s. It's relatively, I mean, there's not, uh, as far as we know, there's not an armed conflict that the, lots of U.S. military involved in. So you're in the military for eight, nine years. So and I'm in, no, not quite. Um, I'm, I'm in the active duty military for about three and a half years. Okay. Um, and then after that, I get out of the active duty military and join the reserve component through the National okay. Guard, and still as an infantryman. Okay. And I go back to school and come to the end of my, my, my basically my college education, one semester short of graduating and about three months short of completing my eight years of military service, okay. which every military service um, yeah, contract is eight years long. Um, so I come upon the end of my military career and the end of my college career, and the U.S. Congress passed a law known as the Stop Loss Law, through which the president is able to commit troops beyond their um, Even though contract. you're supposed to be done at eight years, you were Even though you're supposed extended. to be done at eight years, yeah, and this yeah. is known as the Stop Loss. It's actually a movie about it. Um, and the, the company commander basically called the company to attention and he said if you were about to get out of the military, you've been extended to the year 2031 through this okay. stop loss. And so rather than thinking about graduation and grad school and going back to my civilian life, now I'm thinking about Iraq and the rationale behind the invasion and the it's occupation. It's almost, it's tantamount to a draft of people that have enlisted. What well, they mean, call the backdoor draft. Right, backdoor right. draft. Okay, so now you... This is when you're... This is 20, um, 2003, January and so of so now you're sent to Iraq. So now I'm sent to Iraq. No, and actually, you're a, at this point you're a staff sergeant? At this point I'm a, a sergeant promotable. Okay. And we get sent to Jordan first for two months to conduct uh, security operations for an uh, air defense artillery site. And then from there we go to Iraq in uh, April of 2003. I get promoted in Iraq to staff sergeant, I'm a squad leader. So I'm basically in charge of nine combat uh, soldiers. And as soon as we get to Iraq, uh, the first mission that we have is to run a, a POW or a prisoner of war camp where we, our, our job, our mission was to soften up in, uh, prisoners to be interrogated, which basically we did through a number of tactics that amounted to psychological torture by depriving people of their sleep, sense of space, sense of light, and performing mock executions and things like that. And this was the first mission that we had in country in Iraq. And so up until that point, my opposition to the war had been very abstract, very intellectual, very um, political. But as soon as we hit the ground in Iraq and we go to our first mission, I begin to become familiar with the reality of war and the yeah. atrocities that we commit. And following that mission, we engage in more uh, operations that were more in line with our, our job, which, is, which was the infantry, and began to do combat patrols and raids and set up ambushes and things like that. And it becomes very clear that we're not there to help the Iraqi people, but to oppress and to crush dissent. Five months after that, and you know, five months after all of this is, is happening, I get sent home. So basically, seven, after seven months of deployment in Jordan Must and have created Iraq, some tension between you and the superiors that are asking you to do this. I mean, are you willingly taking your, 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 uh, your troops? Are you? So because I was a squad leader, I had uh, control over squad operations. And as we were conducting squad operations, and I was the one calling the shots, mm 
I took every precaution and every measure necessary right. to ensure that there would be no right. loss of life, unnecessary loss of life. But when it came to larger missions at the platoon level or company or battalion level, then I was basically just one within a right. larger, much right. larger, okay. much larger unit, one squad leader among, um, within a much larger unit. And because of the, uh, the way that we were conducting the missions, which were basically, it was a way that was basically designed to instigate firefights rather than protect life, I began to question that and I began to question the soundness of the orders that we were being given, which amounted to suicide missions. And there began to be some friction between myself and the chain of command. Uh, my squad was uh, disciplined at some point. Um, people were mocking us. They were, saying, they were calling us the humanitarian squad <laughs> because we were going out of our way not to kill Iraqi civilians. Yeah. Um, but eventually things normalized. They sent me home on a two-week furlough and then during that time, for the first time, I had the ability and the peace of mind and the safety to think about the Iraq war, not only go back to my political opposition to the war, but now adding my on-the-ground experience right. and the things that we right. had done, the torture, the killings. And I decide, decide not to go back to the, to the war, but to actually speak out against it. And then eventually I surrendered myself to the military. Um, I gave a press conference and I talked about the reasons behind why I wouldn't go back and declare myself it's called a conscientious objector. It's, it's, it's called conscientious objector, which is actually a status that the military can confer on people that uh, have a moral, religious, philosophical opposition to combat. Right. But in your case, you weren't granted that, obje that conscientious objector status. I was not granted uh, conscientious objector status, but at the same time, because of my outspokenness and because of the things uh -huh. that I was talking about, Amnesty International did adopt me as a prisoner of conscience. And so when I was eventually court-martialed and sent to prison, uh, an international campaign was launched by Amnesty to secure my early release and my safety, which worked as a you know, protective measure for me. Yes. Uh, being in jail, receiving thousands of letters, and people paying attention to what was happening to me. Um, so you, I went to jail for nine months, and then I got out of jail in February of 2005, and then began doing an organizing uh, with the anti-war movement, and then wrote the, the memoir, and then began doing work with the yes. memoir, giving talks and going to conferences. You, you said you began questions. working with the anti-war movement. I just wonder what your sense is um, on two levels. What's the consequence of uh, the, the experience you have on other troops in terms of their mental health and their, their participation? I mean, particularly if you're talking about a poverty draft. Um, and the second thing is, how did that transpire? So I know that for a while um, there was the group called Iraq Vets Against the War, and you were a, a participant in that. So there's kind of two questions in here. Right. What's the basis for something called the Iraq Vets for War? Is it is it something that, uh, you, in your experience, other active duty soldiers would uh, identify with if it wasn't for the fact that they were under orders? Or is this something that is uh, an exception to what might be the standardized uh, uh, media image of what a veteran is? I, I mean, I think that the Iraq Veterans Against the War, uh, our platform in the beginning um, was very effective. We had three points of unity and they included taking care of veterans once we return home, reparations to the Iraqi people, and you know, the uh, withdrawal of all troops from Iraq. Right. And I think a lot of people could relate to that because this was a time when the war was costing about a billion dollars a week, and soldiers in Iraq were going um, on combat missions without full combat loads of ammunition, without enough water, without bulletproof vests and things like that, without radio equipment. Um, and so there was a lot of questioning in, in, in with regards to what's going on in, you know, at home. They're saying support the troops as but a way to silence the sand. But meanwhile, the troops are going out there into all these missions right. without the proper support. Meanwhile, the government is awarding a billion dollars a week to corporations that are, you know, uh, reaping the profits of the war. Uh, so a lot of soldiers were able to relate to that message. A lot of soldiers who were, who were more, a little bit more politicized. Uh, and who had a political critique of U.S. intervention and occupation in Iraq and elsewhere, uh, also were able to relate to uh, that point of unity yeah. of withdrawal of all troops and then taking care of the troops when, once they got home because a lot of the people who served in Iraq and also Afghanistan returned home with a lot of trauma and a lot of uh, medical issues and emotional, psychological issues. 
And today we have a, a, a suicide epidemic uh, among the uh, veteran community. We have 20, 22 suicides every day. More, more people have been lost to suicide than to the actual wars. Either not able or not uh, willing to make the kind of decision you did, but still not able to escape the... the uh, that, the, the, but also the lack of resources yeah. devoted to taking care of veterans once they return home. Yep. And so there were many levels um, on which a lot of the veterans basically related to not only my position towards the Iraq war, but also to the platform that we had and the three points of unity yep. that we had at Iraq Veterans Against the War. We're now called about face because we realize that the, uh, the Iraq war would fit within a larger context of US intervention and about face basically speaks to that understanding that it's not just about the Iraq war, but it's about the entire uh, global war on terror and how that falls within a larger context of U.S. Well, I want to I want to move to that the question of U.S. foreign policy on a on a global scale. But before we do, I just wanted to to uh, because one of the connections was is why does the public support this war or why does the public support that intervention or the the sending of this missile? It's it's partly the argument and the evidence that's presented. And I don't know if it was in your book or if I heard you've mentioned it before that the first thing that happened when you got to Iraq with the uh, equipment it, you had that because one of the justifications was there were weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, and, and I, again, I, you related the, uh, the example. You get there and the first thing you were told. <laughs> right, so uh, part of the reasons why we were deployed to Iraq, or so they said, was that Iraq, the, the Iraqi government had weapons of mass destruction and that it had stockpiles of chemical weapons and you know, there were uh, reports of possible sarin gas attacks yeah, yeah, and things like yeah. that. And I remember some people going crazy in the U.S. buying uh, the 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 duct gas. tape to yeah. seal their windows <laughs> and uh, gas masks, yeah. you know, in the case of a Protect chemical yourself attack. from a threat is a good reason to go to war. Okay. Right, because that was one of yeah. the main reasons yeah. why we went to Iraq right. or how we justified or how right. the government justified invading yep. and occupying that nation. And the first thing that we were told once we arrived in Iraq was to put away our chemical protective gear. They said, we know that they don't have any chemical weapons. Yeah. We're not here to find so any. So you're telling one thing to the weapons. American people at home, but the troops that are on the ground, you're telling them the, the, the real, the, the a different story. The troops that are on story. the ground are yeah. exposed to a much different reality. Yep. Um, but and, not and weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> not weapons of mass destruction, for sure. That well, military was, had been devastated, not only by the uh, first Iraq war, but also years of sanctions and the isolation of the Iraqi government. So the, their their military was shattered, basically, yeah. and I think that uh, we as a military and the U.S. government knew that uh, very well, which is well, why they told us to we, we could here. continue to discuss this, and I know the war in Iraq has, has been a topic of debate uh, for many years and will continue to be as long as the U.S. Is, remains there. But I, I raise this point about the weapons of mass destruction and that Hussein was a dictator and the U.S. has to protect, intervene for humanitarian reasons because I wanted to get to the other half of uh, um, kind of your personal journey, um, being born in Nicaragua and having a connection to Nicaragua and your parents both being connected with the, uh, the uh, anti-dictatorship movement, there's some understanding. So there must be some irony in being uh, a prisoner of conscience for Amnesty International and then find out that Amnesty International and the media in the U.S. is, is reporting that in Nicaragua there's another humanitarian crisis caused by mm -hmm. another dictator requiring more U.S. intervention. So I just wonder if there's a, a parallel between the reasons that were given for Iraq and the reasons that are surfacing now um, around Nicaragua. Definitely. There was a shift in my activism um, that started or that took place in April of this year when uh, mainstream uh, news media outlets in the US and Western Europe began to report that the Sandinista government had basically become a, a dictatorship and a tyranny. This is a Sandinista government only because the person that was elected president at the last few times with a fairly majority vote was a member of the Sandinista party. So it's a democratically elected government that is being presented as this dictatorship. dictatorship. Right. Okay, um, I just wanted to... Definitely. No, the, the uh, last election, which took place in 2016, uh, had 68% voter turnout, and of that 68%, approximately 72% voted for the Sandinista Party okay. and Daniel Ortega and Rosario Murillo as the president and vice president. Uh, but the news media uh, spin was basically that the uh, government had passed a series of reforms to the retirement system that hurt the poor, and that students had taken the streets to protest. Uh, 
and that the government has sent out the police to murder them uh, because they were protesting. Again, and I find this slightly ironic that uh, the, the, the government was going to uh, reduce, I think it was Social Security, which is something the U.S. Congress is on a uh, uh, unrelenting campaign to uh, get rid of Social Security and Medicaid, and there's no, there's no uh, suggestion at all that this has any, would, would have any effect on the population or in any way that it's not democratic. But in the case of Nicaragua, where they, for a very short period of time, I understand, they, they changed the rate, but then they replaced it. But that didn't do anything to stop the protests. Is that... Right, because the, the, the protests, in my opinion, had been part of a, a larger um, initiative or a larger regime change operation, which is basically just waiting for the right um, social issue to arrive that they can flip on its back and manipulate and then feed through social media to generate uh, fear and rejection of the Sandinista government and vilify the Sandinista government, mm -hmm. much like they vilified the Iraqi government talking about weapons of mass right. destruction and stockpiles of chemical weapons, connections between Saddam Hussein and 9-11, which was never proven well, the, the, to be true. Uh, with that parallel, though, I wonder if the parallel that Hussein was a dictator, which I think there's probably empirical evidence to support that, whereas I would question whether there's empirical evidence to support that somebody that got 72% of the vote is somehow dictatorial or the other programs that exist in Nicaragua, which certainly aren't what existed in Iraq. So Right, no, and that's one of the main arguments that they're making is that the elections were fraudulent and that the uh, Sandinista government has manipulated all the institutions to ensure its perpetuity in power. Uh, but the elections were monitored by the Organization of American States and they ratified the election as clean and they said that the will of the Nicaraguan people um, was basically enforced through the election and the result of the election. And some of the reasons that people would vote for that political party, that political leader, was because of the social programs that have been developed. I mean, I think the, the viewers would need to know just a few of those. We don't have a lot of time, but maybe Definitely. you could summarize that. No, following 16 years of um, bourgeois and uh, oligarchy governments that basically uh, were obedient to United States policies, uh, the, the country was shattered by poverty, uh, infrastructure was crumbling, um, healthcare, education, you know, were out of reach for the poor. Um, like most countries trade. in Latin America, okay. <laughs> like most countries in Latin America, like what we're seeing in Honduras and yep. the caravan yep. traveling to the United yep. States to flee repression and poverty and hunger. Um, following the victory of Ortega and Murillo in, 2000, in the 2006 election, things changed drastically. Uh, between 2007 and 2014, they were able to cut poverty by half. Now I think they've been able to cut poverty by two-thirds uh, two or three-fourths. Um, healthcare became um, basically available and accessible to everyone. Okay. Not just basic healthcare, but treatment and medicine and whatnot. Education through um, college also available to everyone infrastructural upgrades, uh, hunger eradication programs, and the way that you can verify that it's not by, by going to the Nicaraguan government and ask, asking them, but you can go to the uh, International Monetary Fund, you can go to the uh, World Bank, you can go to the UN, and look at the vital statistics, look at the reports on the economy, and then you'll see that the uh, Nicaraguan model, which is not very uh, uh, in line with US policies or neoliberal well, that would seem, I mean, if, if, uh, if viewers or others can look at the World Bank or the IMF or the UN and find that there's uh, health care, education, nutrition, um, no violence, it would seem like that would be something that would be uh, celebrated rather than, uh, as you said, vilified or ridiculed or, or exactly. seen as a threat. What's the, what is the threat from the eyes of, and I wouldn't say the current administration because it existed in previous administration right. as well, but what's the... What's the um, why the uh, sudden um, concern for humanitarian and civil rights and uh, the threat, I think they've even said it was a threat to the U.S. and world peace. So the new why Troika at this of evil, yeah. uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba. Cuba yeah. uh, well, I mean, I think that we don't have to go very far. Think about some of the policies that have been implemented in the United States and how they're aiming to privatize education and how health care is out of reach uh, for millions of Americans, including people who have private insurance because of the co-pays and the premiums are very high. 
and don't do not include like certain yeah. treatments and things like that. Um, education being privatized. I mean, I don't know how much be, uh, students pay here for tuition, uh, but this is basically the neoliberal model: is to privatize and cut programs and services, uh, to do away with safety nets like minimum wage, environmental laws, labor laws, which the Nicaraguan government has not done. Basically, they have developed an alternative type of economy, which is grounded in uh, the popular market, and this is basically uh, a type of economic model through which. The uh, Nicaraguan government provides uh, Nicaraguans poor, Nicaraguans peasant, Nicaraguans, uh, Nicaraguan indigenous women, etc., different sectors with the resources that they need to produce and to uh, carry yeah. out uh, trade and commerce internally, which has been very successful and stands as a existential threat to the neoliberal capitalist right. uh, world model. I, I just summarized the threat of a good example. We could talk at length, and maybe we can do this again at another time, but that's all the time we have for the program today. Thank you, uh, Camilo Mejia, for joining me today on Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. See you next time. Mm -hmm.